So good morning. Uh, today's theme is how to tame your fears. Um, and that means that we will be looking at early sales to connected parties in administrations. There are new regulations coming in uh, and this will be our briefing on those. I'll be covering the why, the when, the what, the how, the who and the where of these in the next 30 minutes. So first of all, to look at the why. Why do you have to try and tame your phoenix? And the answer is the new regulations. The regulations are known as the administration, open brackets, restriction on disposal, etc., to connected parties regulations 2021. Um, those of you who like acronyms may find yourselves calling them tariff debt CPR. Um, I'm going to call them the Phoenix Prepack Regulation. I don't suppose anybody else will. And I think we can expect to see, uh, possibly within the next few days, uh, a new SIP 16 dealing with prepackaged sales in administrations. And perhaps we might also see a new SIP 13 uh, dealing with the disposal of assets to connected parties in an insolvency process. As for the when, very, very soon, the new regulations will take effect on the 30th of April 2021, and they will be triggered by you taking appointment as an administrator on a new administration on that date or later. So they won't apply to administrations that start on an earlier date. In terms of the, the how, um, what is a what is a phoenix? Um, a phoenix for these purposes uh, is a substantial disposal, um, and that is the key definition, I think, in the new regulations. A substantial disposal will trigger your obligations to comply with the phoenix prepack regulations. And a substantial disposal, um, it is a disposal which is widely drafted to include um, a hiring out or sale. Um, it is a disposal of a substantial part of the bus company's business and assets or all of it. Um, and it's a disposal by an administrator within the first eight weeks after the company goes into administration counting the day of appointment as the first day of those eight weeks. It can be in a single transaction or it can be a series of transactions um, and it only counts as a substantial disposal if it is to a connected person. So we'll have a look at each of those in, in part. The first one is how much is a substantial part? Well, I think substantial part is just more syllables for a big bit. Um, and I think you will have to err uh, on the side of caution in that because how much is not defined in the regulations. So it will be for us to form our own view as to what it might be. And I think it will be possible to find that even in a breakup sale, your agent might be selling a substantial part, a big bit. Um, a single property sold at auction might be a big bit of the business. Um, even just one laptop that happens to hold the marketing database, um, given how many companies own very little in terms of hard assets, that alone could actually be a big bit of the business. So if you've got your pen and paper to hand in terms of your action points, what I think you're going to need to do is I think you're going to need to review your instruction letters to agents to make sure that you specifically uh, instruct agents who are marketing and selling assets for you uh, to comply with the, the regulations. Um, and I think you're also going to have to review your instruction letters to auctioneers and to solicitors who are preparing auction terms because of the risk that a, a, a property and assets sold at auction might actually amount to a substantial part, a big bit of the business. In terms of how I think this is going to work out in practice, I think the regulators will probably look at this from the perspective of 
whoever it is who might be thinking of making a complaint about this. So I think if it looks to the outside world, particularly to creditors, suppliers, uh, other stakeholders, external stakeholders in the business, if it looks to them um, as if a big bit of the business has been transferred to a company connected with the directors, I suspect that the regulators will probably tend to take their, their side in it. So it might be quite difficult to assess um, whether you are transferring a substantial part or not. And you might find yourself beginning to treat anything other than the very smallest disposals as being uh, treated as if they were a sale of a big bit. It's also critical to triggering the regulations that the sale has to be to a connected party. And there is a new definition of connected because we haven't got enough definitions of connected parties in the insolvency legislation, it would seem. So there is a new definition of a connected party that is used only in the regulations. And it is actually in the primary legislation itself. It is in paragraph 60A of Schedule B1, um, which was added to Schedule B1 fairly recently. Uh, specifically to allow for legal regulation of fee annexes. Um, it was due to expire before now, um, but uh, more recent legislation has actually extended that. So it is now a permanent part of Schedule B1. But that's where the statute of connected parties are. Um, in terms of assessing who is a connected party, you have the bus company itself, and you have the bus company's directors, including its shadow directors and other officers. And then you have the associates of the directors of the bus company. And so we need to look not only at the definition of the parties, definition there, but we also need to look at the definition of associates. And the definition is the existing definition that we um, have seen before in section 435. And basically it is anybody who is related to the directors, their business partners, um, and it is people who are involved in controlling the business, is, is the, sort of the, the, the principle behind the definition of associates. Now the definition in section 435 also includes employees, but that has been cut out of the definition of a connected person for the purposes of the Phoenix prepack regulations. So the effect of that is that if you are transferring a business and there are some employees being tupid across, then the fact that there are some employees being tupid across to the purchaser does not make the purchaser connected for the purposes of triggering the Phoenix prepack regs. It takes a greater degree of connection than simply transferring employees under TUP to do that. So back to the diagram and we've got here Busco as the magenta dot. We've got the directors of Busco as the gray dot. And around that we've got this sort of cloud of associates of the company and associates of the directors. And similarly, when you look at the buying company, uh, there will be these clouds of associates around the company itself and the directors of the buying company. If there is no overlap at all between those clouds of associates, then you don't have a connected transaction. And that means you don't have a substantial disposal for the purposes of triggering the prepack regulations and you can ignore them. But if you have just one person who is an associate of Bustco or its directors and also the purchaser or its directors, that establishes the connection and that then triggers the need to follow the Phoenix prepack regs. Sometimes it's going to be very obvious that there is a connection. There will be a much larger overlap than that. 
But this is really the test that you need to follow to see if anybody, or to see if it is a connected party transaction. You have to look to see whether any one or more people, just one person alone will do it. If they are, or if they ever have been, an associate of the company in administration, other than as an employee, or if they are a director or an officer or shadow director of the company in administration, or if they are an associate of a director, other officer or shadow director, then that makes them connected to the company in administration. We have a similar test for the officer. And if there is one person who is connected to both in that way, then both the buyer and the seller are connected. Now, it is going to be almost impossible, I think, for administrators ever to be sure that there is no connection between the selling company, the company in administration and the purchaser. So I think you are going to have to be looking at having specific warranties and representations from the purchaser in which they will either disclose that they are not aware of any connection having made appropriate inquiries or they will disclose that there is a connection and I, I think you will need to make it clear to them that they will have to tick one box or the other. You don't mind which box they tick as long as it's the right box um, and if they're not sure then they should be treated as if there is a connection between them. Uh, the definition of, of connected is, is, is very similar when the, the buyer is not a company, when the buyer is a sole trader or a, uh, a partnership. So back to the definition of a substantial disposal, as I say, this is the, at the, the, the core of the, the new regulations. Um, it's a disposal which includes a hiring out or a sale of a substantial part of the business by an administrator within the first week, eight weeks after the company goes into administration. And it can be one transaction or a series of transactions to a connected party. Now, if you have um, a substantial disposal, if you have a fee annex for the purpose of the regulations, what are the consequences for you? Well, essentially you have two options. One is legitimate avoidance to make sure that it is not a substantial disposal for the purposes of the regulations. And the second option is compliance to accept that it is or it might be a substantial disposal and there are therefore statutory procedures that you have to follow. So let's look at legitimate avoidance as the first of those. One option would be to use liquidation rather than administration uh, as the procedure of choice because the regulations only apply to administration appointments. They don't uh, apply to liquidation appointments. Second one would be to wait eight weeks before selling anything to anyone. So if you were actually able to trade the business for eight weeks, like who does that these days? Um, or if you were able to uh, mothball the business for eight weeks, um, in that case, you would not need to, um, to, to, to worry about the application of the, the, the new regulations. Um, another one would be if you don't sell a substantial part, um, but that I think is is going to be really quite difficult uh, because, as I said, even even if you have a breakup sale, it's quite possible that that uh, any one of the bits broken up and sold might actually amount to a big bit, or it might be that somebody might buy several of the assets, and between them, those assets might add up to a big bit and thus trigger the, the regulations. Um, the other one would be to make sure that you're not selling to a connected party. Um, and as, as I've said, that can be quite difficult um, given how wide the, the definition of connected parties are. What won't work um, as a means of avoidance is um, putting the purchaser in on license um, because it will be quite clear that, that it is quite clear from the definition of a substantial disposal uh, that 
hiring out the business uh, or a substantial part of it is treated as a disposal. So you, you, you can't just put the purchase on license for eight weeks and complete the sale at the end of that period. That won't work. Um, and selling to an intermediary who is acting for the purchaser and who you know is going to be transferring the assets on to the to somebody who's connected with the company. Again, that won't work because um, a substantial disposal in a series of transactions will itself uh, trigger the need for compliance. So if you are stuck with a Phoenix and you have to comply with it, what do you have to do? You, you have two options. Um, you can either seek creditor approval or the other alternative is you can get a qualifying report from somebody appropriately qualified who is known in the regulations as an evaluator. Let's look at creditor approval as being one of the two ways of complying with the new regulations when they bite. Um, I don't think you need to get creditor approval in advance. So in, in cases where you're confident that you've got the creditors behind you, you could actually sell right away and then get creditor approval afterwards. The procedure for getting creditor approval is that you are supposed to, to circulate details of the transaction in your proposals um, and then ask for a decision to approve the transaction. That has to be a separate resolution. It can't be rolled up in the resolution approving your proposals. It does need to be a, a standalone. Uh, resolution and it takes only a simple majority to pass it um, and it looks to me as if you should be able to use deemed consent to get that approval. I don't see that there is any requirement to actually use a decision procedure. Creditors do have the right to modify the resolution so they can ask for changes to the terms of the sale. Um, you don't have to acquiesce to the creditor's request there. Um, you have a, a veto. Uh, they can modify the resolution only if you consent to the modification. But of course, the risk is that if you don't uh, agree to the modification, you may not get consent. So that's the first way of complying is to get creditor approval. The second way of complying is to have a qualifying report uh, as defined in the regulations prepared by an evaluator. Now this is strictly, it's not your decision, um, it is for the purchaser to commission the report. Uh, they will uh, find somebody who they think is suitable as an evaluator and they will brief them and instruct them. You, however, have to decide whether the evaluator is actually up to the job. Um, and to do that, you have to consider the knowledge and the experience that they have got, but you are supposed to give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, this is the sort of situation when you might actually want, as a firm, to have your own policy on what your minimum qualifications and experience for an evaluator should be. So if you have um, a purchaser who is thinking of commissioning the report, you've actually got uh, a bit of paper written down somewhere that you can send to them and you can say, look, if they've got this experience and these qualifications, then we will approve them as an evaluator. If they've got less than this, we'll still think about it, but the chances are that we won't. Um, and that, that might make your, your job a little bit easier. Um, once you have the report from the evaluator, you have to look at it, you have to think about it, um, and you then have to uh, certify it as a qualifying report, um, assuming uh, it is um, uh, prepared in accordance with the, 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 the regulations. And the report will have a conclusion to it, and the conclusion will be either that the evaluator is satisfied 
or it will be that they are not, in which case that is a case not made opinion. Now, the evaluator will have suitable experience and they will be properly insured. Um, the qualifying report will contain what I'm describing as all the proper guff. Um, there is a list in the regulations of what the report has to contain and it will be your job just to tick off that against the, the list in the regulations to make sure it's there. And the qualifying report will say that the evaluator is satisfied that the price is right um, and that the grounds are reasonable, at least if it's a helpful qualifying report, it, it will. Once you've got the qualifying report, um, you, will, you will send the redacted qualifying report. I say redacted, it won't normally be redacted, but if there's stuff that you need to take out of it, uh, you can redact it. You send it to the company's house and to the creditors. There will be occasions when you get an unhelpful qualifying report where the evaluator either thinks that the price is not right or that the procedures that the administrator has followed in marketing the, the business don't look right or there's something about the relationship between buyer and seller that they're uncomfortable with. And in a case like that, where you have got a case not made opinion, you still have as an administrator the discretion to overrule the evaluator and sell the assets to the connected party. But you have to prepare a written report on why you are doing that, which becomes a matter of public record. And you have to be aware of paragraph 74 of Schedule B1, which is the right of creditors to ask the court to intervene where they're unhappy with um, a decision of an administrator as potentially causing unfair harm. You might find that the evaluator is yeah. intending to prepare uh, an ad and they're going to get another evaluator. The new evaluator will have to disclose the previous report uh, in their own qualifying report and evaluators will have to deal with that point in their engagement terms. Um, that I think an evaluator will have to say if they are sacked, they will have to pass on um, information that they have got and their draft report to the new evaluator. Um, and you will also have to deal with the previous adverse report um, in the same way as you would with uh, a positive report by re reporting on it to Companies House and the creditors. If you find that things have changed since the report was prepared, so it's out of date, um, if, if circumstances have, have, have changed so that uh, whatever conclusion the evaluator came to is, is clearly uh, no longer relevant, um, then you shouldn't certify the report as a qualifying report and you will have to give the bad news to the purchaser that they need to get uh, another report. Um, I'm not going to talk in, in great detail about what the requirements are for a qualifying report. Um, I, I will just say that uh, I'm thinking about uh, accepting appointment as an evaluator myself so I have had a look at this in some detail um, and if there is interest um, please, please note your interest in the chat box and we can run another session on the, the, the nitty gritty of a qualifying report if that would be helpful. Um, having said that um, I'm willing to be a, an evaluator myself, um, this is what's involved in being an evaluator. Evaluators have to self-certify that they have the right knowledge and experience to do the job. They have to be insured, they have to be independent and they uh, must be not disbarred. Um, the administrator also has to decide whether the evaluator is uh, an appropriate appointment, but there you're supposed to give the evaluator the, the benefit of the doubt. The evaluators must not be connected with the company in administration or those behind it. They must not have a financial interest that could cause a conflict of interest. So I think evaluators will have to operate on fixed fees. Um, they should not be uh, asking for payment by, by results. They shouldn't have advised the company or a connected party before. They should not be the 
administrator um, and they shouldn't have been convicted of a crime of dishonesty or be insolvent themselves. So what happens if the regulations bite and you don't follow them, you don't get creditor approval, you don't get an evaluator's report? Um, the, regulator, the regulations don't actually say anything about this, uh, as is normal with insolvency law, where you're told things that you must do, but you're not told what the consequences will be of failing to comply. Um, I, I think it's likely that in some cases, the courts will be willing to declare the sale invalid and set it aside. Um, quite where they will draw the line on that is anybody's guess. I think they will be quite reluctant to do that simply because of the sheer disruption um, and the damage that can be caused to third parties if a sale is set aside. But that's certainly going to be a possible uh, result. You might find applications to court under paragraph 74, which will be asking the court to modify or overrule your decision to sell, effectively declaring the sale invalid, or paragraph 81, which can actually see you removed from office as an administrator. And of course, I think the regulators uh, will be uh, enforcing breaches that are brought to their attention as well. So let's look again at compliance, what you need to be doing here. Um, you need to be considering the alternatives, the way of avoiding having the regulations applying at all. And the, the best way of doing that will be either to run a liquidation rather than an administration or to delay the sale by more than eight weeks. If the regulations do bite, um, then it, if it's possible to involve the creditors pre-appointment um, and get creditor approval, I think that would be a sensible thing to do. I've had a question no, no, please. Please. about uh, is using uh, it. I, I've, I've had a question about um, whether uh, the secured and preferential creditors need to approve, or is it all creditors who approve? And it is just a simple all creditors. Um, so it, it will be the normal rules for voting um, on on approval of resolutions in administration, which essentially just means um, unsecured creditors uh, get the right to vote. So that's one way of being being ready for this is to involve creditors pre-appointment. The, the other uh, approach I think would be to have um, an evaluator lined up um, in good time uh, to be ready to review and report on this. There are some knock-on effects, possibly the unintended consequences. Um, one is that it's not clear where the line is between selling a substantial part and selling something that is not a substantial part. And I think you are going to have to be very cautious about that. Um, so I think you're going to have to make sure that agents know what they must do to comply, um, particularly in terms of identifying connected parties and reporting to you if it's possible that a buyer might be a connected party. Um, sale terms, um, whether they're the sale by you or even a sale by an agent, I think they must contain warranties of independence by purchasers so that you've actually got something signed by the purchaser to say they are not a connected party or disclosing that they are. Um, you may find that best practice might develop to be that when it comes to issuing your proposals, you will actually disclose every single connected party sale, no matter how trivial, um, and you will have um, a deemed consent resolution to validate all of them. Um, retrospective resolutions or reports, as I said, I think those are going to be possible, but somebody will get their fingers burned when they expect to get clearance and don't. Pre-appointment <coughs> pre sales um, would be possible, but of course they involve greater risk for the, the directors, the, the, the purchaser. And I think they would be looking to mitigate that risk by having something like a pre-appointment report. So in those circumstances, you think, well, why not do it by the book anyway um, and get a, a statutory report? 
I think that's covered pretty well everything that I wanted to to cover. Um, so um, if you've got any questions, please do raise them now. Um, otherwise, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you.